Well, I, I already introduced our next speaker, Rich Berenick from Rice University and the founder um, of, uh, I guess, CEO, right, of, of Connections.org as our spiritual godfather at Coral. And what I mean by that is, I don't know, I guess about five or six years ago, I saw a talk that Rich gave online, again, a TED talk where he was talking about this new thing called open educational resource at resources and he was also talking about the economic model behind it and many different com compelling ideas the whole notion of open scholarship even and how it can impact your university so i've asked him to reprise that talk uh, he knows that he is his background is in electrical engineering and computer processing um, so what does he have to say to foreign language specialists? It turns out he has a lot to tell us. So with that introduction, Rich Berenick. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Can everybody hear me okay? I'm really loud. I'm really loud. Hal, can you hear me? Great to see you here. Uh, so it, it's, it's fabulous to be here. I, I was uh, speaking with Carl earlier uh, today. I, I gave a talk at, at UT we're not even sure, four years ago. Uh, uh, and, and it's just amazing to see the progress that's been made here at UT and with the center, uh, growing uh, tremendously, growing a network that is really going to eventually wrap all the way around the country and all the way, all the way around the world. So it, it's fabulous to be here. It's also great to be here after Hal and Susie because they've had all the tough questions and so uh, now I can just be uh, really relaxed, right? But, but honestly, if you have uh, uh, questions that are still simmering, either from Hal's talk or from Susie's talk, feel free to throw them up uh, during my talk because I'm sure we're going to touch on many of the same uh, issues and that uh, hopefully I will have somewhat different of a response that might, that might add a little bit to the discussion. So I, I view that I have really two jobs, other than answering questions. Uh, two jobs this morning, one is to consolidate on the gains made by Hal and, and Susie over the last couple hours. And the, the second is to try to uh, inspire some lunchtime conversation, right? Because we're going right into, the, right into the lunch, okay? And you might notice that the word disruptive was taken out of the program because it was too edgy, too edgy. <laughs> But we are going to talk a little bit about uh, dis disruption today. So I, I think we, we wouldn't be here today. The p none of us would be here today if we didn't uh, all realize that there are significant problems in this country worldwide around the, the educational materials development and dissemination system, the education industry. Call it what you, what you will. Na namely, that it's, it, as, as, as people noted in the questions before, uh, it, during Susie's talk, the development process is, is glacial for uh, educational content. It can take three to five years to write a good textbook. It can take a long time to customize materials for your particular class. And this leads to all kinds of problems, right? It means that it slows down the transfer of knowledge from generation to generation. In fast-moving fields like engineering or medicine or science, there are things in books that aren't true anymore, right? It's very often the case in in electrical engineering where I teach that people will make lab manuals for a certain computer chip. By the time the book is written, the chip is not in the catalog anymore, right? So fat, Pluto is still in the nation's textbooks. We need to get rid of it, et cetera, okay? The other thing is, well, after this long process, we still end up with the same old stuff. We end up with content that tends to be siloed, that doesn't talk to each other, uh, uh, and increasingly, uh, we have poorer and poorer access to these materials because of the incredibly fast uh, rising costs, uh, costs of educational materials. And I think everybody here is on the same page. Anybody disagree? You would have left by now, right? You would have left. Okay. And, and the, the fundamental reason, I would argue, is that, that these problems exist is because we're still working in, in, in a factory mentality, a factory mentality of developing materials and a factory mentality actually of educating our students, right? We pump in raw materials at one end, matriculants, right? And at the other end come out graduates, right? And, and uh, I would argue that there's a better way. And the, the way that we've been pursuing for the last 
12 years at Rice, is, is, is to use exploit networks, and really two kinds of networks. The first, uh, networks of information and knowledge, and really trying to build a system that, that goes beyond a linear paper textbook and acknowledges and exploits the fact that knowledge forms a really interestingly non-linearly interconnected web of, of, of information. And it's actually these interconnections that really excite people and really, really cause them uh, to want to learn. For example, in language learning, teaching someone about a language in the context of what they are interested in. If they're an engineer and they're going to go to Chile, teaching them Spanish right, in the context of being an engineer can sometimes catch on a lot better than in the context of visiting uh, the bakery, right, for example. So knowledge is interconnected in very, very interesting ways. And not only that, but people are interconnected in very interesting ways. And these people networks can allow tremendously powerful new means to generate and, and, and codify and distribute uh, knowledge. And so everything that I'm going to talk about today, and in fact, I would argue everything that this, this center is about is pursuing open standards for both the, 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 these knowledge networks and then forming networks of people to, to build up these networks, right? So openness is, is, is really, really the key. And the fundamental idea is to move from this factory to an ecosystem, right? To a coral reef, to something with great diversity, right? Of, of, of possibilities and great richness and great, thus great value. So you can really think that we're trying to move from a factory to a reef. Everybody, Cal has talked and Susie has talked about the enablers, just to review, just so it's clear for, for my presentation. This would not be possible without technology, right? Everybody knows about technology? Anybody? Uh, the web, internet, the fact we have virtually free storage, virtually free communication, virtually free distribution, that, that's critical. Uh, we can think now of a textbook, like I like to think of it, not as a 600 page pile of paper that's glued together, but a collection of Lego blocks, right? These leg individual little blocks of knowledge uh, that can be combined in all kinds of different ways. So I really like to think of a book as a collection of modular structures rather than this big tome, okay? The other big piece that's been talked about is IP, right? Open source licenses, uh, things like the Creative Commons, show of hands, everybody, we've talked about it all day, we'll come back to this later. That, that not only makes it easy to share content, but safe. And that's really important. And Georgia Harper is going to talk a, a lot about this tomorrow. She's the legal expert, uh, tremendous expert, uh, in uh, uh, everything around uh, legalities associated with content. But we'll also talk uh, more, more about intellectual property later. So if you tie these, these two together, uh, you have a really potent uh, uh, way of thinking about designing and building new kinds of textbooks. So I'm going to talk. Uh, from the context of connections, which is, as Carl said, this is a project we started 12 years ago. So I think a part of this talk is a case study of what we've learned over the last 12 years. Connections is a, is a repository of freely licensed uh, open textbooks, uh, monographs, reports that are built out of Lego blocks, about 19,000 of them. So it's really grown a lot since I was here last time, probably by about a factor of five. And the usage has grown by about a factor of 10 since I was here. We currently serve about 2 million unique users per month from basically every country connected to the internet. The Connections has content at all levels. There's, there's uh, people putting in readers uh, for, for three-year-olds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds to learn how to read in India that are in four, uh, the plan is to be in 40 different dialects so they can cater to all the different dialects in India. Uh, and uh, we have a lot of material in, in a lot of other country, uh, uh, languages. Vietnamese is a very big one, French, Spanish, uh, et cetera. Okay? So uh, language is, is, is really important. Uh, uh, the prototypical book, just to give you a sense without doing a demo, to give you a sense of what things look like in connections. Well, everything in connections can be viewed. It's actually really swanky XML markup, but it can be viewed like a web page. Right? This is a, a book uh, called Collaborative Statistics. It's one of our most used textbooks in Connections. It's used in uh, uh, introductory math and statistics classes at community colleges and colleges all, all around the United States. It's written by Barbara Lowski and, and Susan Dean. So it's completely free online. It, we also have an EPUB uh, uh, mechanism so that we can push out really nice EPUB for looking at on your phone or your, your iPad, et cetera. And then we have a pretty sophisticated print-on-demand engine to push out PDF files that can be printed on demand and bought either by individuals, by instructors, by, or by bookstores. 
right? And these, everything on this side is free, right? Everything online is free. Paper costs money, so we have to charge something for the book. But the prices are obscene, right? Extremely low. In this case, a 600-page book, it's about an inch and a half thick, for about $26. That's about a hundred and something dollars cheaper than it, it used to be when this book was published by a big, uh, by a big publisher. Okay? So that's an example of one book. Uh, since we were, I was here last time, we've, we've, we've got involved with a, a, a number of large partners, and, and I'll talk about four of them now and a, a couple more later. One is the uh, Community College Open, Open Textbook Project that is a collaborative of 200 community colleges across, uh, across the United States and Canada that's developing a, a suite of free textbooks. The, the collaborative statistics book I just talked about was the uh, fl uh, launch book for this uh, uh, for this, this project. I'll talk more about community college and, and intro college books uh, at the end. Uh, another very interesting partner is the Shuttleworth Foundation. Anybody know who Mark Shuttleworth is? He's a South African. He was an uh, internet entrepreneur, uh, the world's first space tourist. He went up in the Soyuz, right, a long time ago. Well, he we think we have problems in this country. I mean, South African education system is a abject disaster. Okay, abject disaster. He wants to change it, and so his uh, his approach was to do two things. One is actually purchase a fairly large K-12 publisher and make all of their textbooks available for free, and then start building communities of teachers to start improving, updating, and keeping that material alive. So that, it, so that the, the project becomes not just free books, we'll talk about this later, not just free books, but a, a, a teacher development process so that teachers got better right, over time because they were contributing uh, to developing the knowledge base. And this is really uh, uh, starting to take off. All this material is available in Connections, and in fact, uh, a, a very large proportion of its use is in this country, okay, is in the United States, and, and we'll talk more uh, about that later. Another interesting example is uh, we've been working with the government of Vietnam for the last uh, uh, six years or so. They actually run an instance of our software, the connection software, uh, inside the country of Vietnam. Uh, they actually have more modules in their, their system than in all of connections, over 20,000 of them in Vietnamese. And they're, again, using this not just to develop new material, to have lower cost materials, but doing it as a uh, f a professional development part of their uh, 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 as, as a professional development exercise to make people better better teachers. And then there were a lot of questions about quality control, and we'll talk more about this. Is all like presaging what's going to come later. We actually have the IEEE involved for uh, uh, actually peer reviewing the content that's in my particular area, electrical engineering content, and they are uh, uh, applying the same tried and true. Uh, standards of peer review to these connections materials so that people can not argue over whether they're high quality or not. And so we'll, we'll also talk, uh, talk a little bit about that. Okay? So, so any questions at this point? I'll just keep plowing along. Yes? I have a quick question about the cost of the. Uh, are these books black and white only? These are uh, not color copies. Excellent so point. Right? This, is, uh, this, is a black and uh, this is a black and white book. Uh, four color books are considerably more expensive. I'm sure they are. Uh, but uh, in print on demand, they're considerably more expensive. However, if you do uh, offset printing for color, the cost comes down dramatically. So, for example, if you wanted, and I'll talk at the very end about fancy textbooks, professional kind of developed uh, OER textbooks. And the expectation there is that uh, rather than doing print on demand for, for materials that really require four color, like biology, anatomy, Courses like no, that. Like textbooks, we use color for ending on words. Yeah, exactly, words. exactly. Right? But there's also all kinds of different uh, uh, quality of color. There's text color versus image color. Text color is considerably cheaper than image color, like high res color. Does that, that, that help? Yeah. OK, yes? So language textbooks, because we have authentic material, sure. all sorts of copyright issues, which sure. we were discussing. And that's very expensive. Mm. So how does that work? Clearing copyright. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and Georgia Harper will talk more about this tomorrow. Uh, m the only answer I have to that is that this is a, the world we live in, right? And this is a, this is, this is a, a, a problem. It's a challenge. But 
that content is locked up and is locked up by the copyright holders of that content who may not understand what we're trying to do with this movement and therefore it may be inaccessible and it may be that we have to invent our own, you know, build our own new content that is similar to that but within the friendly confines of Creative Commons licensing. Experience with this yeah. problem because I have several textbooks and because I'm on the SAT committee for right. Spanish, SAT is having all these problems with copyrights and they yes. don't want it because it's incredibly expensive. Absolutely. So last year they sent us to get the pictures. You know, when you have an SAT sure. test, you look at a picture, you hear you hear something, and then you respond depending on what you hear. I'm not a professional photographer. Absolutely. None of it, the people in the committee are professional photographers. We made incredible mistakes when we took totally. the picture. It was a huge fiasco. Totally. But it's the problem, you know, it's a problem when you're trying to save money and totally. you try to do things yourself. Totally. Well, and, and Georgia Harper is going to talk about this exact issue tomorrow. Oh. But the, the, okay. the bottom line is the copyright system in this country is broken, completely broken. There's, and, and unless we can convince Congress to change it, which is very unlikely, we're stuck. And, and, and Susie mentioned earlier this phrase, it takes a village. Well, what it's really going to take is a village of not just uh, the educators who, like, who write text and think about pedagogy, but it's going to take people who are good at art, people who are good at photography, to join into this movement and, and literally create a completely separate universe of content that's licensed such that it can be used and, and reused in, in easy ways. But this is just the world we live in. Right? That, 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 it's not, not, a, it's not, not a happy, happy answer, answer, but I don't know if there's, there's, no, no, there's, there's no, no better answer. answer. Have to be honest. Uh, other questions? Yes? Yeah, I, I just have a question about sort of the economy of this. Sure. Uh, it's a good idea. We do as much as we can on that sort of thing, but it, somebody's got to pay something. Absolutely. I, I just don't see what's sustainable about this as a movement, as a, it, you know, it's great. I have, you know, I have nothing against this. Sure, 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 sure. I just don't, if I think, okay, we want to do more than we're doing, who, 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 how do I, maybe it's because in the last couple of years I've been working, I mean, the, since we've had these cutbacks, I've been thinking all day about, you know, yeah. every day, about how to generate revenues sure. to do what we want to do, sure. to pay for students, whatever. Sure. So I'm trying to figure out how this will really work. Sure, good, good point. So, uh, I, wow, I have like nine answers. So let's see if I can remember uh, all the answers. Uh, the first is, is that I, I'm not arguing that we should become socialists, right? Even though I'm from Canada, right? I'm not arguing we should become so. Money is very important in this for sustaining uh, for sustaining this ecosystem, okay? Uh, and so I am, uh, so that, that's answer number one. It's not an answer, but just a point number one. I'm not coming to you saying you should do stuff for free and, or we should all sort of hold hands and I'm not, I'm not talking about that. Uh, uh, so that, that's one. I should start writing these down, okay? Uh, they're, they're all streaming by me. The, 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 the main thing that I would argue is that the thing did you notice that this book costs money, right? Right. This book actually costs money. So there is money changing hands, right? And, and there is an opportunity, for example, for a project like Connections or a, set, uh, uh, a network like yours to add, what if you added $4 to the cost of this book, a mission support fee to support the center, right? E e you heard Susie's statistics. At least in the near term, the next five years, it, it turns out that if you off, offer an open textbook in a class with a web version and a print version, you still convert 50% of the students to buy the print book, right? 50, half the kids are going to buy the book. That could be a support revenue to come back to uh, support a project. You might ask, what about the other $100, right? A for-profit publisher that would charge $126. I would argue that most of that money is actually waste, right? It's wasted and that basically What's going on here is very similar to class, and we're, we're going to talk about later, classified ad industry 15 years ago versus today. Who looks at classified ads? Who looks at Craigslist? 
everybody goes to Craigslist. Well, how's Craigslist going to sustain themselves? It's completely free. But what basis right? do you have for saying that it's wasted? I mean, have you actually studied what publishers? Oh, are? absolutely. Okay, We're, but from okay. the author's end point, absolutely. From end point it's, you know, it, it's very lean. Uh, you work on a shoestring budget, it, it seems to me, from where I'm it standing. Sure is, that's sure that's is. And, and in fact, what, again, I'm always saying I'm going to talk about this later. It's great. I can always say later, later, later. Uh, Publishers add tremendous value to books, right? They add tremendous value. I'm just arguing that there are inefficiencies in this industry that could, that could, first of all, provide free books and also provide value-added books that are even swankier that are maybe 50 bucks, right? And thereby increasing access for students and also uh, uh, providing bigger impact for authors. Okay, that, here's the other argument. You talk about the freemium model? Yeah, well, yeah. So, but let me just say another thing. So, how many people here are uh, faculty members? Okay. How many people here have a day job? How many people view that as part of your? I'm joking. I know the answer to these. How many people think that as part of your job to make an impact on the world? Right. Okay. How m So, so here, here's this the the one thing that I want to get across. Okay. Very, very important. Very, very important. Who knows about the long tail? Okay. How many people here want to make impact? How many people here want to make money? How many people here think they're going to make rent? Actually, how many people here make significant money from writing books? Significant money. Wow, fabulous. Okay, well, you might want to leave the room. Okay. <laughs> well, actually, what percentage is that, Carl? Okay, so actually, we have three people. Well, actually, I want to know you. Uh, no, we have three people out of how many? 50? That's fine, 6%, say. No, is that right? Well, significant money. Okay, let me just give you. So I would compare, I, I'm all over the place here, but I would compare the, the educational material, publishing, royalty business to the music business. Yes, ma'am. But there is another issue. You know, I don't make significant money from my textbooks because right. it's a com less commonly taught language. Sure. But what I get is promotion, Absolutely. tenure, you know, very mm. significant. But I'm just talking about money. If you're, if, you're, if you're an electrical engineer and your material is licensed by the IEEE and it's, it's reviewed by the IEEE and has the status of an almost journal paper, I'd argue that is better than having a book published by Wiley. Because these are the people who are the arbiters of quality in electrical engineering. I would put the professional societies, at least in my world, even a little bit above the standard publishers. We could argue about that. But yeah, because the textbook is reviewed by many, many people. There'll be a long yeah. list of reviews. Sure, sure, sure. OK, so this, the good, good question. I hope this is helping. I'm kind of all over the place. But here's the thing I want to argue about money, and that people have just a mis mistaken impression of where the money is. And it's exactly like the music industry. Carl plays guitar, right? When he was young, right? He's a great guitar player. Uh, when he was young, he thought, I'm going to pick up my guitar and I'm going to be Bruce Springsteen. How many people think that? They love playing music, right? But what's the fact? What's the fact of the music industry? Right? There's a thing called the long tail. Okay? 0.00001% of musicians make 99.9% .9 of the money. Bruce Springsteen, Madonna, Coldplay, Frank Sinatra, whatever your favorites. Very select few make all the money. Everybody else makes no money. And it's exactly the same thing in educational materials publishing. There are people who make, I have friends who make as much as their, they make their salary every year on book royalties. But they're like one or two or three people in the entire field. Everybody else doesn't make money at all. Why are they doing this? Why are they writing books? Because they want to make impact. Because they're looking for a conduit for their content to get out there and to get used and to be valued, right? Well, here's the key thing, and I'll just use my own personal experience. I started Connections because I thought I would write a textbook, because I needed to get my ideas across. If I had written a textbook 12 years ago for electrical engineering course, a junior level course, I probably would have sold, uh, well, I probably wouldn't have been Bruce Springsteen, right? I would have been like, whatever. I might have sold 5,000 copies. That's pretty good. That's pretty good in electrical engineering junior level textbooks. Okay, that calculate the royalty stream. That's not very much money, and that's a little bit of impact. I put my textbook into Connections instead. It's been used six million times. That's why 
That's the argument. That's the argument. Worldwide. My book's translated into Spanish. It's four times more popular in Spanish than in English. Right? If I get one consulting gig from putting my material into connections, that pays for all of the royalties I would ever make from a book. So the point is just don't focus on the money. Don't focus. On, money's still important. You have to sustain. But don't focus on the money as the, the end goal. Focus on impact as the end goal. Once you do that, all of this starts to make a lot more sense. Because then we're just trying to build a system. Can I just create. break in and answer the yeah. question? So we are making money on open textbooks. And so we're charging, we are creating revenue, just as, as Rich mm -hmm. was saying, for French or Yoruba or whatever. I mean, not a lot. But if you get millions of users and they're paying you one dollar, that's exactly. a million dollars. So exactly. that's when the light bulb went on. Exactly. I we can distribute this to the, the, the scale of the internet changes everything. And then let me, let me give another answer, because it's great to have all these answers. So we, we really view connections as uh, like Linux. Who knows about Linux? Okay, oh, Linux. Oh, come on, it's free. Can't be any good, right? Right? Oh, can't be any good, right? 60% of the world's web servers run Linux. Okay? Linux is completely free, completely open source, commercializably usable. Okay? What is Linux? Okay? Well, let's, let's take out connections here. Wow, there's an X in both, right? Linux is software. Linux is a $3 billion industry for something free. This is crazy. Why? Who's heard of Red Hat? Okay? Well, here's, there's Red Hat. There was VMS. There's all of these. Linux is an ecosystem, right? It's a coral reef. It's not a thing, right? There are tremendous opportunities to make money around Linux. And guess what? Those, those entities pour resources back into the Linux community to make it better, because guess what? They make more money, right? What does Red Hat do to Linux? They just add value to it, right? They put it in a box. They put it on a DVD. They give you a 1-800 number to call when it doesn't install. And they give you someone to sue, right, if you're like a UT or a Rice, if it doesn't work, right? So they add a lot of value, but they only charge 99 bucks, for example, per installation, right? Imagine the same kind of thing. Imagine now you take out connection or Linux, you put in connections, right? Imagine, and we're going to talk a lot about this later. Imagine those uh, printers, right? Printers are going to make money, right? We use a printer called Coop, who prints our books. They send emission support uh, revenue back. They do revenue sharing with us, right? Imagine homework systems. Right? Like a WebAssign, like a, like a Pearson Learning, like a, et cetera. They could do revenue sharing, where the, maybe the textbook's free, but the student pays 29 bucks a, a month to, get a rev, uh, to, to do their homework online, and a little piece of that comes back to the system. Right? And this can work. Just uh, the one case in point, at, in uh, the early 2000s, uh, the company Red Hat employed fully 50% of the world's Linux programmers. That's ecosystem, right? They realized, wow, the better Linux gets, the more money we make. Let's build this ecosystem, right? So, so this is the, the thinking that I want people to, and once you think in this way, impact ecosystem, it really is a disruptive way. And, and the other thing that I'm going to talk about at the end is that this is not antagonistic to the publishers, because they're free to participate in this. Okay? They're free to participate in this, at least to our approach. OK, any other questions? I hope I, I didn't give 11 answers, but I gave a five, maybe. Uh, OK, so unexpected consequences. I already talked about this. Translation uh, blew up a lot quicker than we would have expected. And my book was actually translated by some graduate students, really smart graduate students from UT El Paso, right? UT El Paso, who wanted to contribute to the open education world, but they didn't feel like they could write new material, but they could translate. Okay, and this has now grown into a project that, that we're actually building four parallel engineering curricula in the four languages of North, main languages of North and South America, right? So it's called engineer, Connections of uh, Engineering for the Americas, right? So that's, that's an interesting example. Another very couple interesting examples that I think is much more interesting than the big players are people like Kitty and Sunil. Okay, let's just talk about them for a second. So Kitty Schmidt Jones is a uh, stay at home mom, music teacher in Champaign, Illinois. She's a fabulous music teacher. Every, every year, 
she is, impacts about 25 kids, right? And they just love her to death, right? She was thinking, well, how can I scale this up, right? How can I impact more than 25 kids? And she just happened to find out about connections because her husband, the electrical engineer, came home one night and said, man, we're going to do this connections thing because we really need it for electrical engineering. And she said, what are you talking about? I mean, th electrical engineering is not the crisis in America today. It's music education, right? Right? Everybody has their own, right? But her point was, what's the, and it's very similar to languages. What's the first thing that's cut when they cut the budgets? Languages, music, and her point was that music, in her case, is a gateway to understanding math, physics, science, all kinds of areas. So she said, okay, I'm going to dedicate a year and start writing some material, right? So she is not the usual person who would write a music theory textbook, okay? Sunil Singh, he's a parent. Have any parents here ever tutored their kids, okay? Have you ever noticed the textbook is wrong? Or at least like unclear? Okay, so what is, he's, a, he's a, a petrochemical engineer in Delhi, India. He started, uh, 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 he started tutoring his kids, making these handwritten notes, you know, centrifugal force, centripetal force. They were all labeled wrong in the book, right? And uh, when he started getting the seventh generation photocopy back, right, he realized, wow, like there's a lot of need for this stuff. So he looked where to put his stuff, started putting it up on the web, and then he put it in the connection. So here we have, you know, a music teacher and a dad, right? So the, they are rock stars, right? Kitty stuff is the most popular material in connections. It's been used 20 million times. It's in the official curricula in Mongolia, right? Uh, huge amount of use in K-12. She was exactly right, right? Huge amount of use in K-12 schools because the teachers, basically, the budget was cut, and they had to go out on their own to buy material. So they love her stuff because it's free online. Again, Sunil, where is most of this, this dad from India, where is most of his use? In this country. Okay? So I actually have a, a silly term for this that I think is really a, a, a useful term, though. We often talk about education and projects of this kind of ilk using terms like outreach. Oh, we're going to do tremendous outreach with our material. <laughs> impact with my material, right? I would argue that the beautiful thing and the powerful thing and the disruptive thing about open educational resources is actual inreach, right? It's getting people from the community all around the world, Spanish speakers from all over the world getting together to contribute materials to show how Spanish is used in different ways all around the world, right? Uh, to, to engineers and scientists and in industry contributing materials that show how, how topics in high school are really used out in the real world. Right? I, so I'm just extremely excited about the Sun Hills and the Kitties much more than the IEEE's uh, and, and, and the Sea of Ulas because I think this is the thing that's really going to allow us to develop even more high quality, relevant, and diverse uh, <coughs> educational materials. Yes? Are you familiar? Take that surplus activity that's contributing exactly. to the Exactly. Fabulous, fabulous point. Uh, another guy who talks about this, Clay Shirky, great guy, John Seeley Brown, uh, has a beautiful talk online. Go to, uh, what is it, jsb.com or John Seeley Brown, uh, where he talks about the rise of the amateur class, right? We think of the word amateur, which is kind of looking down, but actually amateur means, well, well here we are in a lane. <laughs> Everybody here knows what that word means. It's awesome. Uh, you know, it's, a lot, it's about love, right? About, about a, an, an interest in an area. And he talks about the pro-am. Think about pro-am golf, right? So it's a similar thing. We're the pros. But the thing that's really going to be exciting is when the am comes in and we become a, a community because that's where we're going to get the really exciting stuff, at least as far as I'm, I'm concerned, okay? So uh, hopefully that makes sense. So, so what do you do? When you have inReach, so the, the thing that I should be really clear about, about with connections that's very different than a lot of other open education projects is it is not only free for everybody to go in and look, but it's free for everyone to contribute. Everybody. Okay? So think of your worst nightmare uh, scenario, right? So what do you do when you have a completely free open repository for anybody to contribute? Well, you've got to have some way to sift out you know, depending on your interests and your background, what you're looking for, sift out the wheat from the chaff, so to speak. Okay? And the, the, uh, there's a fabulous, fabulous quote from uh, Kevin Kelly in a, a Wired magazine article in, in, uh, just about a year ago. 
and I'm going to read it. Ecosystems need diversity. You have to allow for a waste of time and resources. Now it gets really good. If you knew nothing about the internet and were trying to figure it out from data, you'd conclude it was designed for the transmission of spam and porn. <laughs> and yet, it is, it is the most important thing in, you know, a, a tool in many people's lives today, right? And so how do, we, how do we allow for this waste but be able to find the good stuff, right? And so clearly, we need some kind of mechanism of quality control. And now we come against two fundamental issues. The first is how to balance this inclusivity of this community-based approach with peer review, which is exclusive, right? It's just totally at odds. And the second is, even if we think we should do peer review, okay, people out there probably know peer review is collapsing, right? There's just too, ma too much information being generated. There's just not enough time to do all the reviews. How many people here are un inundated by reviews? Okay, I get a request every two days to review a paper. Right? I can do two a month. Right? It's, it's impossible. So how do we do something that's scalable? And so uh, for connections, we have uh, one particular system that we're really happy with that we think uh, solves th uh, both of these problems. And it's really, uh, it really uh, is, is pretty simple. And we call it the idea of a lens. So here's the connections repository, all this stuff, right? this burbling collection of content. Uh, some of it's great, some of it's not great, some of it's just not at the right level, right? You're a high school French teacher, you don't want kindergarten French, right? It's not useful to you. So, uh, so what we have is, is a, a ability to deploy a layer around the repository, and in that layer we can have a thing called a lens. And a lens is just, think of it like a web page, right? It's just got a URL. It's just a portal, right? When you go to this web page, you don't see all of connections. You only see the stuff that, that is in this lens. So it focuses, everybody got me? Focuses on a certain part of the repository. So for example, you could have an IEEE lens that when you go to I, this URL, you'll only see the stuff that the IEEE has somehow decided that is, is high quality. Does connections do peer review? No, okay? But we allow an arbitrary number of lenses. So arbitrary third parties can own these lenses. So you could have professional associations, you could have ISD, like uh, uh, school districts, you could even have the Carl lens, right? All the stuff that he thinks is really cool. Almost like merging the idea of a blog and a, 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 a peer review, right? It's just because if I trust Carl, I want to see the stuff Carl thinks is cool, right? So, so this is a very scalable uh, approach, and we have currently about, oh, 50 or so of these lenses, and we can have an arbitrary number of these. Yes? I'm trying to get my head around a lens. Is that like a stamp of approval? Could be. An endorsement? Yeah, exactly. It's like a Facebook link. For example, I, uh, these <laughs> o the stuff that gets in the IEEE lens, the only stuff that makes it through is stuff that IEEE has looked at, sent to reviewers, they've given it a thumbs up, peer review, and then it appears in their lens. Nothing else appears in their lens. So it's a... I as the user, then I can choose to see only things... Exactly. So let's look. Can I so say you... Yes, go. connection to make here because we have a representative of Merlot which is a community in fact, that you're talking it, totally. about. Huh? Yeah, totally. keep going. So they have, th these different repositories have different people, and Laura Franklin over here wearing her t-shirt that says Merlot will be talking about the criteria right, right. that they use to vet materials. So if you trust Merlot, and they're like, listen yeah. to the vetters. That's, 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 exactly, and this will make a, yeah, this is really gonna, just think of this as segueing into the, the Merlot talk later, <laughs> that, that they are a lens, right? But they have an even bigger mandate they're a lens not just on a connections repository, but the entire internet. But you can go to, uh, she represents world languages, so there's a lens within a lens. Exactly. Okay, so connections allows, an ar if you come to me, uh, and uh, uh, what's your name? Gabi. So you want the Gobby lens? You can just have the Gobby lens. I have a lens, okay? Your, your, your school could have a lens. You, you could convince your state legislature that it should have a lens. We, we don't limit the, we allow an arbitrary number of these. And if you go to connections, cnx.org slash lenses, you'll see there's like 50 of them. Some are professional societies, some are companies, some are individuals, some are just loose groups of, of educators. Uh, and so the point is to allow each of those to set their own standards and to, to, to set their, make their own decisions as to what is high quality and what isn't. Does that help? 
Question? Let, let, let me just give a concrete example. Say, you know, Carl the other day uh, he wanted to do some detection theory, right? So he went to Google, like everybody does, and he typed in detection of signals. Uh, so he did a Google search, he clicked on the top th uh, link, and all, he, he ended up in connections, right? And he's like, well, this looks, this looks kind of relevant, but is this any good? I don't know if it's any good. I just got to it from the internet. But if he looks over here to this lenses box, he actually sees that it's, hard, it's fine print, but it's been endorsed by the IEEE. If he clicks on that, he goes to the actual lens. Oh, and here's, here's this, this piece of information. Up here, here's who, here's who the IEEE Signal Processing Society is. Here's their logo. Here's who they are. Here's how they decided what, his, uh, what was high quality and not. And then here's a list of all of the stuff they have reviewed. So it's just like a portal of quality stuff reviewed by some organization. Yes, sir? Um, I know this is probably ingrained into your system too deeply at this point, but you should change lens to endorsement. Oh, yeah, 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 that, uh, good point, yeah, good point. But is good it point. endorsed by? Yeah, 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 sure. And in fact, well, in fact, it, it does, and in fact, th this is out of date. This is way, bi the endorsed by is way bigger, so yeah, very good point. And anybody else? This, uh, Question, go. Just difficult, but do it. if I have a textbook and I really want everybody to look at it, and I contact you under 12 different names and ask you for 12 different lenses, would I endorse my... I mean, do you have a way of preventing sure. that? No, no. <laughs> uh, how could we, right? There were, okay, so there's, there's two sides of it. One side is g actual, uh, uh, we believe, and what we've seen is eventually, the, um, okay, so there's the connections repository. It's uneven in quality, say. Their, their lenses are uneven in quality, right? And so, the, the, again, the, the best lenses will rise to the top, right? Because once Wiley has a lens, if you trust Wiley, well, you'll go use their lens, right? You know, and you won't trust the. Will prove to be fake. Over exactly. Time by being not real. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. But also, but on the other hand, there's always going to be people gaming. The, the right. same thing happens with Amazon and everything else. Peer but but peer yeah, peer review has problems. the same problem, right? This is peer so, review times about. Yeah, I would say these are not our exclusively our problems. They're they're they're. they're yeah. Other questions. Okay, so let's, let's keep going. Uh, and let me just say that if anybody uh, wants, and this could even be useful for your group uh, because it's decoupled from connections, but we actually built a, uh, a lens management system. It's basically like a, I don't know what you use in your community, but uh, a lot of engineers and scientists use Manuscript Central. It's a, yeah, it's a, it's a fee-based service for doing peer review to have editors and reviewers and handle all of that stuff. We actually built an open source system that we have available through focus.rice.edu that you could, you could set up for your own use, for example. Right? Okay, hopefully that makes sense. So let, let's end with talking about the road ahead. And t uh, 10 minutes or five minutes? Because I, I don't want to go over time. Five minutes. Okay. So th I, th I think the thing that I hope people can see is that the world of educational materials, everything, course materials, textbooks, mo even journals, uh, there's a lot of people out here who say, oh, come on, these things, have, this, this has been around kind of the same for how many years? How many years have we been do doing this kind of stuff? It's either 500 or 600, or if you go all the way back to the Greeks, long, long time you've been writing down educational stuff and passing it on. Okay? I, am, I would argue that we're in a period of disruptive change, and that this world, the same things are going to happen to this world that happen in these worlds. Okay? The newspaper industry is going to be completely different today, uh, in the future from what it is today. iTunes destroyed the music industry, right? Yeah. depending who you talk to, and then reinvented it in a wholly different way. That, that had new business models emerged, uh, and other ones were, were basically made redundant. Right? Computer hardware, software, things like Linux, et cetera. There's no question that the kindleization of the world, whatever you want to call it, is really going to change things. Really going to change things. And so uh, uh, I think it's important to follow what's going on in OER. Y even if you don't want to do OER, you should watch because it's going to be playing a role in, in all of this disruption. So wh what's going to happen? So I would argue there's really two hallmarks to what OER is trying to do. The first is disintermediation, cut out the middleman. Craigslistization, right, if you will. Uh, the second is disaggregation, so new efficiencies through specialization, right? Uh, 
These are sort of businessy kind of terms that are, are, are market forces. These are forces, though, that reinvent uh, industries. And so I think the, the, what I've been talking about for the last, uh, what, 50 minutes is how these forces are ch going to change publishing, right? Books and learning materials. But you could even ask more broadly could these forces affect our schools, right? Our colleges, our universities. Does anybody think it could? I think the only question is when is this going to happen, right? It's not will it happen. It has already started to happen. We talk about uh, tenure, right? And, and, and you could probably see that, that a lens like the IEEE lens could actually make educational materials useful for promotion and tenure, right? So that's great. But on the other hand, is there going to be any tenure in 10 years, right? Not clear, right? So the world is really going to change. So let, let's look at some of the just examples. Uh, open textbooks are just the start of this whole thing. So disintermediation, right? How much do students pay to go to UT? 20, 30,000 bucks probably. Rice, it's about $39,000. Okay, here's a, here's a very interesting university. I don't know if people have heard of it. Started by the guy who does Cramster, if you know Cramster. So I don't know what his uh, uh, ultimate uh, goal is. Uh, but this is an actual university that he is trying to develop, right? That is, comp that is basically free, completely free. All the materials that they used to teach are online open educational resources of some kind. You just pay an admission to fee to get in, and then you basically pay just to take exams at the end, okay? This seems kind of silly, okay? Seems kind of silly, but 10 years ago, University of Phoenix seemed kind of silly. Okay, and it is no longer silly. Okay? The really key thing is unlike MIT OpenCourseWare, where they always made such a big deal about we have open resources, but this is not an MIT degree, this is going to grant degrees. Okay? What happens when you start coupling? Well, actually, we'll, we'll talk about this in a sec. Okay, here's another one. This is dear to Hal's heart. This is, did you talk about badges? Yes. Badges are big, okay? Really big. Okay? Uh, uh, so I won't say anything more about it, right? But but peer-to-peer -peer university and other uh, uh, Mozilla Foundation, other organizations that are doing badges, uh, yeah, big big deal. Alternative certification, okay? And where that, why that is a big deal is again, we talk, we just talked for the last hour about uh, the factory model of educational materials, and I said it at the very beginning, but our universities and schools are a factory, right? We pump in matriculants at one end and we pump out graduates at the other end. What, this is like oil companies 50 years ago, okay? Oil companies aren't like that anymore. Oil companies are like banks now. Everything is disaggregated and split and contractors do everything. Why is that not gonna happen to our schools, right? It is, gonna, it is inevitable, I believe, that this is gonna happen to our schools. And I had a great call, we talked about one Christensen earlier, a great call with Clayton Christensen. Anybody know Clayton Christensen? Disruptive innovation, innovator's dilemma. I mean, the, the, uh, these, these people who think long into the future are saying there's also going to be a long tail of schools and colleges. And there's going to be a few, maybe top 50 schools, top 20 schools at the top, the Harvards, the Yales, the Princetons, who will probably remain relatively unscathed over the next decades. And every other school is going to be completely reinvented according to this mold. Okay, it's scary, right? Scary. Example, who knows about this? Who knows about the free Stanford courses? Show of hands. Okay, did anybody talk about it this morning? No. Totally important thing to keep in mind, okay? Because they're offering free access to anyone in the world, right? It's a lost leader, right? So let me just fill, or act like just fill people in. Three courses at Stanford are being made available this year. Again, it's totally reaching way beyond this MIT open courseware thing of, well, uh, here the idea is all the lectures are online, all the homeworks are online. They will even give you a letter. That they're, they're doing office hours online. Okay? Uh, they will even give you a letter at the end saying you took the Stanford AI course or the Stanford uh, machine learning course and you achieved, you know, your ranking was here, you know, in the, in the, how many students are enrolled in these? 100,000 students are enrolled in these courses. Okay, so why do we think, what conceit do we have that we think the AI course in the future is going to be taught by, I don't know, a thousand different instructors at a thousand different schools? 
going to be taught this way, right? right? It's going to be these massively online organized things. And sad reality is faculty, a lot of institutions are going to be reduced, well, re yeah, reduced to tutors, right? To, to lab leaders, et cetera. I'm not saying this is good. I'm just saying it's, it's going to happen. Right? Just to give you a sense, at Rice, we're actually, I'm, I'm actually teaching a course. <laughs> there was a lot of flack. I'm teaching a course uh, this semester, and the assignment in the course is take the Stanford course. <laughs> and you know, we're, I'm, I'm doing it not to get out of teaching. Right? That would be awesome right? if I could do that. Uh, we're doing it to e explore and understand. Right? Is this any good? How, how close are we? Right? And the other thing, is this being recorded for posterity? Or? Yeah. Okay, so the other thing, if you check this stuff out uh, and just look, uh, yeah, if you, if you do a web search on this stuff, you'll see several links down in Google. There's a very interesting conspiracy theories around this. Not really conspiracy, but just there are, there's a company behind this called No Labs. Okay? And they have a for-profit business model, and I believe that this is just their lost leader free thing to get into this market. Okay? It's not just Stanford thinking about this, it's not just companies, Carnegie Mellon, all these. There's certain very entrepreneurial schools who want to control right, this, this space. Okay? Okay. The last thing I just want to mention, that was a downer, right? uh, is back to excitement, okay? back to opportunity in all of this, which is, uh, and th this point was made earlier about uh, the exciting thing is not just textbooks and paper books. It's about multimedia. It's about using these things in, in classes. So I just want to mention, a, a, a think of it like the Connections Lab project, like the laboratory project towards uh, personalized learning. So uh, Sir Ken Robinson, show of hands, people know, fabulous guy. Okay, check out his TED Talk or his writings. Uh, he writes a lot about innovation and how the factory system of education just it's basically designed to strangle innovation out of people, right? Beat it out of them. Okay? And he argues that the only way to, to move to a world that, that where, where, where kids and adults are more innovative is by um, uh, basically moving beyond this factory mindset towards individualized, personalized instruction. And I know this firsthand because at Rice, because we're very small, I have 20 kids in my class, I could take the C student aside and say, like, why don't, what's going wrong? Like, why aren't you doing well in this class? And all too often it'd be like, well, like, this is boring math. Like, it's like my eyes glaze over kind of math. And sometimes I would be able to talk to them and say, well, did you realize this math is how JPEG works? And it's inside your iPhone. And it's, it's how the internet works and wireless communication and MRI scanners and radar and sonar. And suddenly this kid turns into an A student because they, they had a personal, they personalized Right? or contextualize the information in a new way. Okay? So what we're trying to do is, is something similar. So think of taking connections and building an e-textbook now that rather than just you learning from it, it learns about you okay? as you're learning. Right? And the idea is we're trying to, trying to similarly to the, the three big problems I talked about with, with publishing in general, we're trying to, 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 to break down some of the, these, these problems with assessment, right? lack of timely feedback, right? We don't give feedback quick enough to students. Uh, automated systems to provide feedback so you can be timely are very expensive, very fragile. Uh, anybody want to talk about that? No? Okay, no, okay. Uh, well, oh wow, no one wants to talk about it. Okay. Uh, anyway, so maybe I should just end. So uh, what we're trying to build is a system that, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> anybody want to talk about it? No. Uh, so we are, everybody's hungry. So uh, the idea is uh, we're interested in building, taking these materials and building a, 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 an e-textbook that becomes different not just for every class, but for every individual student. And the way, the way to do that at scale, because it's impossible to do uh, at scale otherwise, is by exploiting a global community of authors. Because you have to have now not just one textbook's worth of material, but 25 textbooks worth of material. Not just 100 problems, but 1,000 problems. Uh, and then to replace uh, these very fragile rules-based systems with bottom-up machine learning kind of ideas. It's what you experience every day with Netflix and Google and Amazon. And this just happens to be my day job, so that's very, very uh, lucky. And so the system kind of looks like this. This is the world's busiest slide. But think of connections at the center, and then around it, there are these machine learning algorithms to tune the material that an individual student sees. There's a community tuning, uh, attending all of this. And then we have a, 
a, a, a, a really swanky uh, open source problems and answers database. It was just launched in the last month called quadbase.org. If you're interested, it's really, really nice. Uh, all open source also. We have a similar one for, for uh, multimedia uh, objects called lablets.org. Uh, it is not live yet, but it, it's coming in the next uh, few months. We have a, another repository for video tutorials, a la Khan Academy, et cetera, and then this peer review system. And this is work, this idea of customizing, personalizing the education is supported both by a, sci a grant from NSF, Cyber Learning Program, and uh, Google, who is actually helping a lot with the infrastructure and the, the machine learning uh, component. So just to end, there's some challenges. All this kind of sounded rosy, right? But there's some challenges. And I would say the main challenge is there's a lot of feel goodness in this community, but there's also a lot of non -co collaboration. And it's basically fragmentation of this community due to IP technology and content. Okay? And let me just drill down into these. There isn't one Creative Commons license, there are six licenses. And I believe this is a dreadful mistake. Okay? Because these licenses are incompatible with each other. As much as you'd like to think, oh, I'm open, I use Creative Commons. They're incompatible. <laughs> right? And it's a problem, right? Because someone in connections cannot necessarily legally pull some of, some of the material might be in Carl's repository into a connections book because it might have a different set of uh, different set of Creative Commons at, uh, 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 aspects to it, right? All these non-commercial, share alike, et cetera. And I could talk a lot about that, but we at Connections are fully, fully CC by, right? And I'll talk over lunch with people about this and try to convince you. My ar main argument is imagine Red Hat Mac OS. Mac OS is based on open source software. Imagine whether we'd ever have Red Hat or Mac OS if we ha Linux was non-commercially usable. We never would. Linux would have never taken off. Open source would have never taken off. Right? Everything is commercial. You can't have an ecosystem without commercially usable stuff. It's not sustainable otherwise. Okay? People are scared by that, but it's a step you have to take. Technology, still too hard to share and reuse, right? The stuff in our repositories, XML, the stuff in somebody else's repositories, PDF or Word documents, ah, it's a mess, a nightmare. You can't really pull these things together still, right? A lot of work to be done here. And then the last thing I want to turn to is the point that was brought up very, very early, and I promise I'll, I'll quit, uh, content, right? Too much of OER is like underdeveloped. A few lesson plans, part of a textbook, a textbook that obviously hasn't been reviewed or edited, you know? There are no real good, really, really good turnkey solutions that are on par with what a, a real publisher offers. And so if you were to go into uh, a, a college and say, instructor, adopt my physics material in connections, they're, they're going to still go with the, 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 the standard publisher's material because it's better. Right? It's, very, it's quality, comes with a homework system, right? an online homework system, comes with all the multimedia and the slides and everything like that. And so it doesn't matter if it costs a lot of money, there's no, we, open education still can't compete with this. And so I think the thing that you're going to see over the next couple of years, though, is sis, uh, 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 initiatives that really can compete. And something that I can't talk too much about uh, now. But I'll just mention, say that in January of this year, we're going to be taking a really big step with connections towards generating turnkey solutions for some of the most taken uh, higher ed uh, courses. And so uh, talk with me uh, more uh, January, February, if, if you want to hear about that. So hopefully people can see that these are really challenging times if you're a, a, a educational publisher, right? But they're also very exciting times if you're a educator if, or if you're a, a student, right? Very, very exciting. And I, I think the most exciting thing to me is that for the first time in history, we're building an open educational uh, resource ecosystem to provide really high quality content, completely free, anytime, anywhere, to anyone in the world, right? And this is very high quality content, very diverse content. And, and uh, it's great to have people here participating because I think everyone here realizes that not only does everybody have something to learn, but everybody has something to teach. So thanks very much.